Hallelujah. Can we all stand? Praise the Most High. Good to be back at Living Water Miracle Center, where the Mayim Chaim, the living waters, are always flowing. Can we praise his name? Hallelujah. You know, I know we cruise past uh, all the Psalms as far as 150 and so on and so forth, but um, another really beautiful um, book that you may or may not be familiar with is one called The Song of Songs. Everybody say Song of Songs. It's commonly accredited to Solomon. So in some translations of the Bible, it's called the Song of Solomon. Uh, but the Song of Songs is the actual translation out of the Hebrew. And I don't, I don't question if Solomon was involved because he had a lot of um, extracurricular activities that he was involved with, if that's a, a, a tactful way to put it. But um, I want us to take a look at the Song of Songs. And I want us to read a little bit from that, and then we're going to, of course, uh, flex back into 1 Corinthians. And I just want to pray for a bit. Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness tonight. We ask that you would give us your wisdom, your tender, loving kindness. As we are presenting ourselves before you tonight, Father, we are asking that you would guide us into all truth. And we thank you for the beauty of of the Song of Songs, and I believe it complements well uh, 1 Corinthians 7, a very unique chapter. And uh, I just want to ask that as your word goes forth, it would bring life, health, and strength to our bones. We honor you tonight. We say, Baruch Hashem, Yor Hevav Heloheinu, Melech Halolam, Natan Olanu, Ha'erev Tov, Vemishpacha Kodesh. Amen. Let's look at Song of Songs, starting with chapter 2. And if you actually look at the layout of Song of Songs, it's almost like a, like a musical, like a romantic musical, if you guys are familiar with anything like that. And it goes back with like the masculine voice, the feminine voice, the masculine voice. Now, of course, in Christianity, through the years, which we often do, we like to symbolize things, and, uh, and it's not wrong, but oftentimes people have said, this is like the voice of the church, the bride. Uh, reaching out to the bridegroom, which would be the Christ, and going back and forth. And there is elements of truth to that. But if you just look at the text for what it is, it's a beautiful romantic uh, dialogue interaction. And Yes, sir. Chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse, actually start with verse 14, so we get the man leading off. It's always nice when men um, are romantic. Can you say amen? Now I'm talking like biblical romance, not like, like, like not this jive talking stuff about this, that, or the other. You know, um, you must be tired because you've been running through my mind all night. Some of those old lame, right? Look at you, look at you. Some of you heard, some of you, some of you got some of that, that game talk back in the day, right? Um, my dove, this is verse 14, my dove in the clefts of the rock. In the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Show me your face. Show me your face. Yeah, we're in 214. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, are vineyards that are in bloom. Could do a whole marriage seminar just on that one verse right there, but we don't got time for that. Verse 16, my beloved is mine. Now, this is the feminine reaction. So whether you look at it as a romantic inter, inter, um, uh, interaction, a dialogue, or you look at it as the bride, uh, uh, the bride, which would be the church responding back to Yeshua, however you look at it, it's a beautiful response that she gives. My beloved is mine and I am his. My beloved is mine, and I am his. So in a marriage covenant, there's okay to have, how do I want to say this? There's okay to have an element of possession without being possessive. Did you catch that? There's an element of being, my, my wife's body is mine and my body is hers. But I'm not possessive over my wife or jealous. 
I'm jealous biblically, but we'll, we'll describe that in a minute, but not we're jealous. My beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. 17, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Chapter three, all night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did, did not find him. Now look at her proactivity in verse two. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. Do you see the search that even in the spirit, there's a process. There's times where you will feel like the presence of the Lord, or you will feel like your closeness to Yeshua, that there's a little bit of a distance. You'll feel like you're not really uh, intimately close with him. You're not feeling his presence. You're not having a manifestation. Even when you read the word, it just feels like uh, 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 paper. It just feels like uh, words on paper. It doesn't feel living. But it's part of that, that distance, that draw, that he's looking to see, will you go further? W will you go further? Will you press in more? Will you pull aside? Will you put down your entertainment? Will you put down uh, your social media? Will you put down your job? Will you put down whatever you're filling time with? Some people, it's exercise. Some people, it's binge watching. Some people, it's a combination of both. Some people, they eat, uh, you know, nervous eating. Some people do bulimia or anorexia. I mean, there's all these things that we fill our lives with and not just females. So when you fill these times where you're like, you're searching for him, you, 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 you thought you could find him, you know, just laying on your bed. And then you went out on the streets. You came here to everyday services. It's like you're, you're on this quest to know him because he was searching for you. But now you're responding by searching for him. So there's this divine romance that's taking place. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. Verse 3, the watchman, everybody say the watchman, found me. Wow. The watchman. Interesting term, the watchman. This would be the guard. This would be the security guard in our modern times, right? This is the one who has the shofar, who's there to guard the city. And the watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city, right? The security guard. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them, verse four, when I found the one my heart loves. I held him, so she finds him. I held him and would not let him go. I held him and would not let him go. I held him. Now, this is not an insecure woman. This is a, 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 a bride or a bride-to-be that's on the quest not to lose the closeness that she once had. There's intentionality. Everybody say intentionality. It takes humility to have intentionality like this. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house. Wait, what? To my mama's house? Okay. To the room of the one who conceived me. Wow, because it's all part of the family. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Shh. Father, we thank you tonight that your word is truth and that love is stronger than death. And we thank you, Father, that you are going to teach us something special tonight. And we worship you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to be seated. We're going to jump back into 1 Corinthians 7, starting with verse 28. Uh, it was really cool. Brother Reed shared a, a cool post from a, a, a friend of his or one who had kind of been an acquaintance in times past and who's now serving the Lord. And, and one of the cool things about 
the the little post was she was talking about her children and how many of you guys have ever seen glow sticks glow sticks right well there are certain types of glow sticks you have to break them in order for them to shine to glow right and the moral of the post was that the way you know that a person who is glowing uh, you know in essence that they have gone through brokenness right so a lot of times you see the joy in a person's life you see their uh, radiance maybe you even see a marriage that you respect but you don't know always the level of brokenness that it took to get to that place in fact the qualification to shine is you must first be broken right so you got to be broken not not broken by the the world system but meaning our will right kind of like a horse if you're going to take a horse into war you have to break that horse that it's not going to submit to fear when the arrows and you know the missiles or whatever's going on are flying at it it's going to stay locked in and follow the leading of the jockey or the one who's guiding the horse that's the difference between a broken horse versus what people like to be like wild stallions or i guess a female wild filly right if you went to west mesa right a filly so it's like if you're going to be wild you're not going to be able to sustain the level of warfare because when the arrows start coming you're just going to book off <laughs> you're going to buck and then you're going to book can you say amen amen all right so with all that said let's jump into first corinthians 7 28. I, I i really sense like the holy spirit and it was i wasn't planning to even touch this chapter because i thought that uh last night and then of course pastor johnson they were doing an amazing job tackling it but on my way on my drive last night and I, who enjoyed last night was anybody here last night wasn't that fun that was so cool i love i love those deuces and i love to see the founders co-working together it's such a beautiful sight but on my drive home, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I want you to describe the biblical beauty of the marriage covenant. The biblical beauty of the marriage covenant. And I was uh, talking a little bit with Pastor Johnson just not too long ago, just earlier. And I said, it's kind of like this. Like, I don't know how many of you watch, you know, Netflix or you have different streaming, Amazon Prime or whatever. I'm not trying to advertise for them, but they're common. Um, but if you ever watch even a show that's sort of like, uh, I think pastors watch this too, but there's a series called Cobra Kai. It's like a spinoff of Karate Kid. You know what I'm talking about? So if you're a Karate Kid fan, of course, you're drawn into Cobra Kai, but the, some of the language in there, the innuendos, uh, you know, the season four, they add like all this, like other alternative lifestyle kind of stuff in there. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's sick enough where if you go back and watch like Little House on the Prairie, does anybody know Little House on the Prairie? Me TV, right? Okay, if you've never. So if you go back and watch Little House on the Prairie and you see how innocent it is, you see how pure it is, and then you compare that to even, you know, I'm not going to call Cobra Kai, you know, clean, but maybe compared to some of the vulgarity that's on other series, it would be it would be kind of kid friendly or teenager friendly comparatively because we've lowered our standards but if you go back and look at uh little house on the prairie you see the purity and the innocence of it you compare that to even you know uh, whatever you pick your series that you've been watching or have watched and there's something about the purity of that that it kind of jars you to a certain degree are you tracking with me and this is basically what's happened with the marriage covenant and sexual intercourse, which is an integral part of the marriage covenant. We've had so much defilement. We have so much rebranding. We've had so much uh, uh, perversion, inversion, reversions, just verse, verted, uh, trans, uh, translated, transvested, trans nationalize i mean i don't know find adjectives to describe it but it's taken the purity of what we just saw here in song of songs did you guys see the purity in song of songs but did you also see the passion and the intensity and the intentionality so the world system which is a babylonian system is rooted back to babylon that's why they call it babylonian the babylonian system is rooted in paganism it's rooted in idolatry 
And wherever you find idolatry, you're going to find a form of adultery or you're going to find a form of uh, prostitution. That's why in the book of Revelation, it doesn't call her the whore of Belen, right? It doesn't call her the whore of, you know, uh, Des Moines, Iowa. It calls her the whore of Babylon. Why? Because Babylon is a literal place, but it's a symbolic entity of everything that's nasty, defiled, pu uh, 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 putrid. Um, I'm trying to paint a picture, and I'm maybe not doing the best job, but I'm trying to show you how something that was so innocent, and I just use Little House on the Prairie because I think that's a good point of reference. It's still kind of in the loop. But Little House on the Prairie level entertainment versus... I don't know, level G, PG stuff now, it doesn't even compare because there's so much purity. Can you say amen? Now, with that said, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 7. And I'm going to try to do it in one session, but I might need to depending on how slow I'm going. And it seems like I'm going pretty slow already. Um, but if you, this is 728. But if you do not get married... You haven't sinned. Everybody repeat that after me. But if you do not get married, you have not sinned. Okay. So before I define how beautiful marriage is and how amazing it is, we have to be very clear. You do not have a moral or a biblical obligation to find fulfillment, satisfaction, uh, contentment within a marriage covenant. Can you say amen? Okay. There's just like you have a level of, you know, perversion and sickness, and we've covered that pretty well. There's also sort of a unwritten, I wouldn't even call it a rule. There's almost like an unwritten um, protocol that says, unless, I'll use the women, because I think men don't necessarily struggle with this as much, but there's kind of an unwritten rule that if you are an unmarried woman within a house of faith, that that makes you inferior. Is, is anybody tracking with that? Uh, you don't have to nod or anything, but I've been around enough churches to know how it kind of works. And a lot of it's maybe internal. I'm not saying people project that on you. Some places they may or they may not. But internally, there's kind of this unspoken, nonverbal communique that if you are a single woman, and let's just say you're not a spring chicken anymore, right? Is that, do people still use that term, spring chicken? Is that fair? I'm not using it derogatory, but I'm just trying to use a kind of a colloquialism. Um, if let's just, I'll, I'll put some decades on it. If you're no longer like in your 20s, early 30s, right? And you're maturing and people talk about the biological clock, right? If, if you are in that position and you are not legally, biblically married, right? Like there's people that play house, right? And, and I don't know what that's all about, but I mean, I do, but it doesn't make sense. But I'm saying if you're not legitimately married, okay, not this weird stuff that happens nowadays, but if that's the case, sometimes there's a persona and maybe a lot of it's projected on self, right? Because the way a person views themselves, so are they, right? As I think it says in Proverbs that like as a person looks in the water, when you look at yourself, right? In essence. And of course the word is also a mirror, but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, or as a woman thinks in her heart, so is he. So there could be an internal demeaning of yourself. If your bio clock is ticking or you've already, you know, I'm not trying to use this again, derogatory in any stretch. I'm just using common terms. If you've been around the block and you know, you know, even JLo eventually gets married. Right? So it's like, you're sort of like, if you're feeling like, hey, when is my time going to come? But if you feel inferior, I really need you to capture this verse. Because by no means, if you do not get married, you have not sinned. It's just that I would want to spare you the problems you'll face 
with the extra challenges of being married. The ESV says, but if you do not, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. So it's not a sin to proceed with the marriage, and it's not a sin to refrain from the marriage. A betrothed woman, right? Someone who we call it engaged. It's a little deeper in the in the in the Hebrew culture. I'm not too sure how the Romans rolled with that, but whatever status you're in, if you choose to proceed with the marriage, just be prepared the problems that come with marriage. If you choose to remain single and not be married, then you're going to have to deal with the grace and the dynamics of being single, which Paul speaks very highly of, of living a single life. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. So now I'm going to just quote the word. <laughs> the appointed time has grown very short. When he's talking about the appointed time, he's talking about the return of the Christ. The appointed time. Meaning we don't have a lot of time to, and again, I, I hope people don't take this the wrong way. And I'm not, I'm not trying to like over justify what I'm saying. I just know this is a sensitive topic. So I'm really trying to be cautious with it, right? Because people who know me, I can just be like a little curt, a little straight to the point. But I'm really trying to be, I'm trying to be a little bit more pastoral. <laughs> and that's not really my grace. I'm, I'm, I'm not really a pastoral type dude, although I have a shepherd's heart. Okay. But I'm trying to flow pastorally today so you don't come and and, and give Pastor Johnson a hard time for some things that I said. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The appointed time is very has grown very short. From now on, now you have to read this in context. So don't be tripping out. Some of you dudes, married dudes that are watching online. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. I, I, I'm not making this stuff up. It's right there. Now, what is he trying to say? He's not saying neglect your wife. He's not saying run around. He's not saying stop wearing your wedding ring. He's not saying, you know, live a double life. No, what he's saying is this, the intensity and the urgency of the time, and this is written in the first century, is even if you are married, you should be so dedicated to the things of the Lord that your race versus a single person, because see, a single person, if they wanted to come here, they could just come straight here to everyday services if their schedule allotted. A married woman, you may have to go home and make dinner for your man. He may not be as gracious to just say, hey, just uh, go on off to the service. Now, you may say like, well, I'm a, liber I'm a liberated woman. I don't play like that. Okay, well, just be prepared to deal with the consequences when you get back. So if you want to have an argument because you wanted to go to church and he was out there at home warming up, you know, frozen chicken wings night after night after night, because you're over here being spiritual. Don't be trying to be a married woman and still try to live single. And men, likewise, don't be trying to live like a married dude and you have responsibilities at home to take care of your wife and spend time with her and wine her and dine her and love on her. But now you're playing the God card. Oh, well, no, honey, I got to go to everyday services. Well, okay. Uh, what about Saturday night when we don't have everyday services? You see what I'm saying? So there's a balance to all of this. So here's, here's the bottom line, and then I'm going to talk about the beauty of marriage. And then I, I want to read the text because it's so powerful. I'm going to start again in 28. I'm taking it slow. But if you do not marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman or an engaged woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. Marriage is work. 14 years in this. I can testify it's work. 24 years in here. Can I get an amen? Marriage is work. It's challenging. It's hard. You have two people with two opinions, with two flesh, with two appetites, with two upbringings, in some cases, two ethnic cultures, and you're trying to become echad, one. That does not happen easy. Becoming echad is a painful process of dying. In fact, for men, the number one reason a man gets married is to grow his tail up. A boy becomes a man when he goes through marriage. And even a broken marriage, a boy can still learn the principles to be able to become a better man. That's why a lot of single men don't want to get married. Because they like drinking the milk, but they don't want to buy the... 
I didn't say it. I'm just, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you how it works. Okay? They want the benefits of sexual intercourse, but they don't want the responsibilities of clothing that woman, housing that woman, and providing her sexual needs. Yeah, you might want to go in there, sis, because we're about to get real. Okay, so yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. 29, this is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. I clarified what he meant. 30, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, meaning mourning over a spouse, because this is the context, and those who rejoice as though they were not Rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods. So he's using examples. You, you're burying a family member. Okay, bury them, but move on with life. Don't stay mourning over somebody for 15 years. You know, my, you know, my cousin, my Theo, Jimmy over here died. You know, okay, listen, I'm really bummed that happened. That wasn't cool. But you have the shirt. You know, you remember his name, but you got to move on with your life. You can't reminisce about your cousin Vinny or whatever the heck happened, okay? And I'm not, I'm not diminishing that, but I'm just trying to give you the urgency of the time. We don't have time to pussyfoot around, okay? We, 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 we have to roll as lions, and no matter what comes against us, yeah, it hurts. There's pain. There's sorrow. We're human. We cry. We, we, we weep, okay? Uh, uh, every, every, every child, you should anticipate having to bury your parents. Okay, let me just break it down for you. Some of you live in a fantasy, I think. Maybe some of us do. I'll put myself in there. But nobody ever expects to bury a child. And as a spouse, one of you is going to die first. So someone's going to have to bury the other one. That, let's just be very pragmatic. you got a 50-50 chance you're going to bury your spouse. Okay? So you never anticipate burying your child. You almost guarantee you're going to bury your parent. And you got a 50-50 chance you're going to bury your spouse. So you're going to go through pain. There's a great pastor in, in Bethel, uh, California. He just had to bury his wife who lost her battle to cancer. Okay. So life happens. Okay. It doesn't mean we give up. It doesn't mean we don't have the power of the resurrection. It doesn't mean we don't have signs, wonders, and miracles. It just means that we don't always get it. Sometimes Lazarus is raised up on the fourth day. Sometimes Lazarus gets raised at the resurrection at the end. Okay. Everyone's going to go through the process, but... Sometimes we see it quick. Sometimes we see it later, right? Sometimes I rhyme slow. Sometimes I rhyme quick. <laughs> sometimes I preach slow. Sometimes I preach quick, okay? Uh, tonight I'm preaching really slow. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no good, so your commerce, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. I told you this before. I'm a son of New Mexico, Born, raised on green chili and sopapillas. But I'm in New Mexico, but I'm not of New Mexico. I, I'm, I'm not of this land. Why? I can't be effective if I'm of the land to come and transform the land. I can understand culturally to the dynamics and the challenges and the generational components that we're dealing with, but I can't come and be of New Mexico and transform New Mexico. I have to be of the kingdom but I'm in here, but I'm not of it. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. And you should be the same way. You can't laugh at the same jokes. You can't look at the same Instagram sites. You can't, you can't, you can't, you see what I'm saying? You can't be mi vida loca and then try to walk over here like a woman of God. You can't be, you know, Al Capone, you know, try to be, you know, you know, uh, notorious B.I.G., OG, you know, whatever, Pachuco, whatever, you're, 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 you can't be that and then try to come and walk over here and be, you know, the mighty man of valor. No. You, listen, now you have your own style. Everybody's got their own style and you got preferences and I'm all for that. I'm not trying to change the way you look. I'm saying at your very essence or your core, we have to live this verse out because pastor has been telling us it's all about application. It doesn't do us any good to read through 1 Corinthians 7 and you don't have a greater revelation of marriage and the purity of the marriage covenant. But we would have just wasted our time. But if you can get enough of it to apply it to whatever season of life you're in. Some of you really want to be married. Some of you, if you never get married, you're totally content. Some of you would like to get married, but you're a little concerned because you've had a, some issues. <laughs> marriage has not been a good 
season in your previous life. Some of you have never been married. You've just shacked up and you've just been in relationships. Trust me, it's a lot different. And those, again, and those who rejoice as those who are not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods, 31. And those who deal with the world as though who had not dealings with it for the present form of the world is passing away. 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. Everybody say free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord or concerned, right? That's a better word probably. The unmarried man or woman is concerned about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. And I use the example about coming here. You may call it old fashioned. Well, he should be making me dinner. Okay, well, maybe he should. But if he expects you to make dinner, then you need to meet that expectation or vice versa. If you're a man and you're running over here and your wife is working 70 hours a week and bringing home big money, you should be the one making the dinner. You should be the one cleaning the house. Right? Is that fair? But here's the reality. A single person is going to be focused on how to please the Lord. At least that's the way it should be. But the married person, verse 33, is concerned about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. Say divided. Divided. You, you, you may be wanting to sit around for three, four hours and read the Bible and listen to Maverick City, but your spouse needs clean underwear. Hello? Do, do, do you see how this works? So you go do the laundry and you take care of your other covenant. Then you come back to your first love and you get into your Maverick City and your word studies and you watch the chosen or whatever your thing is. Okay. So there's balance to all this. What he's saying is that as a married person, you're divided, but that's the way it's designed. But before we continue on with this, I have to stay on assignment. I'm giving you pragmatic stuff, but now I need you to roll back if possible. I need you to roll back the scroll of your mind. Go back to that place of innocence before you first saw porn, before you first saw, uh, you know, Chippendales or you first saw, you know, Playboy magazine or whatever your thing was back in the day. And I need you to be able to encapsulate the beauty and the purity of marriage. Adonai, at the very beginning, he created Adam. The word Adam is the word for humankind. It comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which is the word for soil. So the father and the creator of life himself used his beautiful brain and his perfect pure heart. And he took the soil of the earth that he had created and he began to create and mold and sculpt something in his image. He started to design and, and to add value and he created all of the vital organs and he created the exoskeleton and he, he, he put, uh, uh, you know, skin tone into it, the, the, the earth tone into it. And he created, uh, you know, hair and eyebrows and all these different things that have purpose, even that your nose hairs help protect against disease and your immune system and your optic nerve and, and all of the intricate design of the human body that you could read about and learn about in anatomy and physiology. And he created humankind. Now, we oftentimes think of Adam as meaning just a male. But that's not the original intent. When it says he created Adam, it means he created humankind. Inside Adam was male and female. Inside Adam was male and female. Complete. Two reflections of the divine creator was found in male and female. And what the marriage covenant does in its purest sense is it helps to restore back the image of God the Father, the image of the creator by bringing forth male and female into a divine union. You have the masculine side of the father, the defender, the disciplinarian, the protector. 
You have the feminine side of the Father, which oftentimes is expressed through the Holy Spirit, the nurturer, the one who brings reconciliation, the one who's able to bring forth life into the earth. But without both working complementary, not in competition. Without both male and female working complementary with each other, you're not going to get a true understanding of the nature of God. Can you say amen? It's extremely important that we have a clear understanding that God the Father did not create women inferior. Hello? If you think that a woman was cursed after the fall, you haven't read the scriptures clearly. Don't raise your hand, but if I was to take a show of hands in here, how many you believe that women were cursed after the fall? I bet you a few hands would go up. Question? The enemy was cursed. Now, there was consequences to the fall. For men, they were going to have to work by the sweat of their brow. And for women, they were going to now have to have pain when they go through labor. Can any woman who's had a baby say amen? Okay. But in the second Adam or the final Adam, who is Yeshua, those curses or though not curses, those consequences can be rolled back. They can be rolled back. And ultimately, in the millennium, none of that is going to be in place. But if you have a theology that women are inferior, that it, it was a woman who brought sin into the world, your theology is off. It doesn't say through one woman sin came into the world. It says through one male human, one male man. It was through the human man that sin came into the world. Now back to marriage. Marriage was designed to be a reflection, just like we saw in Song of Songs. Marriage was designed to be a reflection of the unity and the beauty of the Creator. That was the original design. It was designed for a male and a female who are devoted and passionately, I'm not going to say in love, passionately committed to covenant. Everybody say covenant. The challenge that we have is we've had people try to express to you what marriage is like without a proper theology of covenant. Covenant. Everybody say covenant. Covenant is not about how sexy you look. Covenant is not about how, how well she, how her body is, how great her body is, how, you know, how great he smells in his cologne and, you know, he drives a, a, a Bentley or whatever she's, you know, she, these are her dimensions. Covenant is about, I am not going into this because of the benefits that I get. That's a contractual mindset. Anybody ever sign a contract, a work contract? What are you looking for? Oh, okay. What are the benefits? What are the bennies, right? What is the 401k? What's the retirement plan? What am I getting paid per hour? What is the scope of work? What's the health insurance? You can't go into marriage like that with that mindset. That's a contractual mindset. A covenantal mindset is not, what am I going to get out of the marriage? A covenant mindset is, what am I bringing that's going to bring value to my spouse in the marriage? Think about Yeshua. He didn't say, well, I'm going to have the Passover meal, drink of my blood, you know, uh, eat, eat, eat my flesh, the bread. We're going to establish covenant. And uh, by the way, I need to make sure that you're coming to church four times a week. I sure darn sure need to make sure that you're tithing. I don't care what any of these modern preachers say because I'm telling you, you need to be tithing like no get out. And uh, I need you to fast a couple times a week. And uh, I need to make sure you're giving me some worship every day. Okay. If you can't meet these expectations, you might want to find another deity. I don't think it's going to work out for us. Okay. Now that sounds comical. But how many people take that same mindset into marriage? Wow, she's going to have to take care of my needs. When I need it, I need it. 
And that's why I got married. I didn't get married for her to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the Bible also says there's a time of a menstrual cycle. And you shouldn't be having sexual intercourse during a menstrual cycle. It's very clear in the book of Leviticus. Okay, that's, that's unclean, unclean sex, even if you're married. Okay, so I have to cover these things because a lot of the times people don't know this stuff. It's in the word, but a lot of people don't unpack it. So you have to have a proper balance to your sexual understandings and fulfillment. You have to have a proper balance to your financial agreements. Okay. Some people sign prenuptial agreements. A prenuptial agreement is saying, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot, but what mine is mine and I'm going to keep mine because if this don't work out, you know, he can take the ring back to Zales, but I'm keeping my, my life insurance and I'm keeping my, you see, I'm not knocking that. If that's the way some people want to go, I'm just saying that's not really biblical covenantal marriage. Now for some people, because there's a lot of scandalous folks out there, they feel like they need to do that because they've been burned already. And they don't want to file bankruptcy again. Okay. So I, I'm just trying to give you like a dose of reality. But I want you to understand the beauty of marriage. Because if all you understand is the blunt force of reality. But you don't understand the beauty of the way the Lord designed male and female to work cohesively together. In a divine romance. Of mutual submission one to another. Did you know the Bible talks about mutual submission one to another? On top of the same chapter it says... Women, wives, submit to your husbands. Not women submit to men. Okay, I'm not at none. I have one wife. I don't need any of you to come and submit to me. Now, if you want to submit to the ministry, to the word, that's between you and Adonai. And you'll get blessed for it. But you as a woman, I'm not asking you to come and be subservient to me and bring me a sandwich. If you want to bring me a sandwich to honor the man of God, I'll receive it. But I don't come with an expectation. Now, my wife, I would like my wife to do those things. Because we're in a covenantal marriage. And it should be a, for lack of a better word, it should be a competition. How can I outserve my spouse? Right? It should be in a, in a best spirit-led setting. It should be, okay, my wife really likes her tea like this and this temperature and a little bit of lemon. So I'm going to try to make my wife the way she likes her tea. Right. My husband likes his coffee like this and he likes a little leche in it. And I'm going to make sure that first thing in the morning, you know, he's got his cup of coffee and he's good to go. You see, that's the way it should work. But if you go into it of, well, I need to get mines. She should be have my coffee ready because I got to leave at five in the morning. Well, why don't you wake up half an hour earlier and get her tea ready one one day and see how that works. You see what I'm saying? But if you feel obligated to have to try to do nice things for your spouse, there's probably even a deeper issue that's going on. You see? But just like our relationship with Yeshua, that's why the marriage covenant is the living parable of our relationship and our walk with the Christ. Why? If you are coming night after night out of obligation, now, I do, it, I do respect consistency. I respect the times that we come and we don't feel like driving from the west side all the way up here to the foothills of, you know, want to bow, but we come anyway. So there are times where you do stuff out of obligation. Same thing in the marriage covenant. There's times you may not feel like having sexual intercourse, but you do it to please your spouse. It's not a booty call. It's duty calls. See, that's why it's good that, you know, they had, they had the, the G room over there, okay? So it's important that we're able to talk about these things openly. Why? If we can't talk openly about marriage, about sexual intercourse in the context of marriage, then what happens? You, you, wherever there's not clarity and definition, it leaves room for ambiguity, and ambiguity can lead to mischief. Ambiguity can lead to people having unclean sex in a marriage covenant and never thinking it's an issue. Or the wife is trying to tell the husband, hey, this isn't cool. But the husband's like, no, we're married. We should be able to do this. No, this is. And that's why when people start delineating between the Old and the New Testament and they start picking and choosing, well, tithing was in the Old, well, prayer was in the Old Testament too. You're no longer going to pray. Worship was in the Old Testament too. You're no longer going to worship. Sacrifice was there. So are you just going to pick and choose the parts that work for you and your guilty conscience? Or are you just going to take the whole word? 
I ain't calling no names, but if I needed to, I would because I don't have no issues with that. I'm very firm. I've studied this word for 30 years of my life. I, 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 every single essence of what I am, stand for, live, preach, declare for 30 years, for 25 full-time years of my life, but for 30 years of seeking Christ and his kingdom and his father, I am adamant that every single word of the Bible from Genesis chapter one all the way to Revelation 22 is relevant to our life. Now, some things are more relevant than others. There's things that are found in the Torah that are only directed to women. There's, there's things that are directed only to women after they have a child. There's directed to, to people who are bearing a, a loved one. So there's certain things there that don't apply for this season of life. But every single syllable word, that's why Yeshua said, not one yod, what not the smallest letter, and not one vowel point will pass away till all these things have been fulfilled. Can you say amen? Amen. I think this is a good stopping point. Are you guys doing okay? All right, let's stand and pray. And I think we'll continue for the last session for those who... <laughs> Want a little bit more circumcision of the heart? <laughs> Amen. Let's, in fact, let's put our hands over our heart because I feel like the, the, the love anointing is going to kick in for session two. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for your faithfulness or session three tonight. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I ask that you would just pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. Abba, every single one of us needs a clear understanding of how beautiful marriage is and the things you're discussing in 1 Corinthians 7, and we need your help. So I thank you tonight, Father, as we take a 10-minute break, as we reconvene back at uh, about half hour in, uh, Father, at the, the halfway mark of the hour, that you will give us your grace and your wisdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. 10 minutes, let's go ahead.